everyone. Welcome to this webinar on designing 3D printed optics with Optics Studio and Lux Excel. I'm Akash Arora and I'm going to be one of your hosts today. Your other host will be Bram Moblock from Lux Excel. In today's webinar, we're going to cover a lot of different things that you'll find to be very interesting. So Brahm is going to talk about Lux Excel's capabilities in regards to additive manufacturing, some of the design constraints on additive manufactured optics, and we'll also present some showcases of things that they have done for various customers previously. I'm then going to show you the capabilities inside of Optics Studio that enable you to design optics with 3D printing in mind. Following the live webinar, we're going to have a question and answer session, which both Brahm and myself will participate in. So if you have any questions, either to, to Lux Excel and their capabilities, or in regards to Optics Studio's capabilities, we'll be able to get all of those questions answered. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Brahm to talk about Lux Excel and their exciting technology. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Yes, I'm going to talk you through uh, what Lux Excel can do and a unique process of uh, additive manufacturing optics. But first, I want to talk to you about why we want, uh, wanted to create an additive manufacturing process for, uh, for optical parts. Uh, we want our users to be able to reduce the lead times. We want to speed up the development processes. And, of course, what is also important in the development is that you, you can do some trial and error. So you can really optimize your design. Um, even based on actual products. So we want to encourage trial and error. We want to postpone your tooling investments. So um, if you make a design and, and it's uh, rather complex, most people would go to, uh, to a tool to create uh, even the prototype part. Um, because diamond toning is a very time consuming and an expensive process as well. Um, but then, of course, if you have to change the design, then your tooling cost will be wasted. Um, it's also possible to, uh, to order smaller amounts of, uh, of parts, even up to uh, a few hundred pieces. And then you can uh, ask them whenever you need them, so you can reduce your stock there. Because if you produce them with the means of a tool, then, of course, you would have to, uh, to order 5,000 pieces or something like that before the manufacturing wants to start up their, uh, their machines. One of the, the other things is that you could end customer customize your products. So you could, for example, for a lighting product, you could create any beam angle that you want, so not only that 12, 24, and 36 degree beam angles that you can normally order. You can also do a 29 degree beam angle, so a special optic for just a special customer. And then additive manufacturing, of course, gives new possibilities. As we've seen in other additive manufacturing processes, like metal printing or, uh, or plastic printing, you can create new kinds of structures. And, of course, you have the possibility to stack different materials together. So in the future, this is unfortunately not yet possible, but in the future we hope to be able to create new kinds of optics that are not possible to make at the moment any other way. For prototyping, we serve several markets. So we serve the photonics market, the general lighting market, which is the largest portion uh, of, of our uh, prototyping business. Um, we serve the automotive, the medical, the aerospace and defense market. Glass market is a little bit strange because we also added the solar market to it. Um, but, uh, we didn't want too large a group of miscellaneous. Um, and miscellaneous is already a big group with virtual reality, uh, glasses, handheld devices, mobile phones, etc. So these are the markets that we, uh, that we currently serve. But of course, if 
someone uh, has questions that operate in other markets, we will also try to, to help them. Our business model at the moment is manufacturing as a service, so we offer fast prototyping where our lead times are just five business days. Uh, for standard products, we have 10 to 15 business days for specialty products. We can also offer the smaller series for, uh, for field testing or for trade show purposes, so if you, if you want to launch your product um, but you don't have the time or the resources to go to tooling, we can pre 3D print the optical parts for trade show purposes. Uh, perhaps for your sales team demonstrators or just for startup series to get your, your product on the market as quickly as possible because of course the quicker you get to market, the quicker you gain market share. At the moment we do not sell the hardware. Our methodology, so what we do is we 3D print custom optic parts. Uh, so we don't work with st any standard optics, so we ask our uh, customers to provide us with a CAD file of the optical part and then we just simply print it. And it sounds very simple, but of course there's, uh, there's quite a lot of tricks behind it in, uh, in our process. I will tell you a little bit more about uh, the process itself a little uh, in one of the next slides. What other services we, uh, we offer is uh, some optical design uh, services, but this is not uh, in-sourced, but we have some optical design partners who've worked with our technology before and that know uh, our boundaries and our limitations. And then we also offer reflective coatings. Uh, we also have a partner for that and we can offer some post-processing through diamond turning or milling. So if a shape is uh, not possible to make with our technology, perhaps with some post-processing into our material, it could be made anyway. A little bit about our process and how it works. Of course, um, most of you will know 3D printing and know the layer-wise build-up every 3D printed part has. Um, that's what you see on the top right picture. Um, you see that typical staircase shape, which is of course not suitable for an optical part because optics need to have the surface in the correct angle and you don't need vertical and horizontal surfaces. The, but what we do is we use a UV inkjet printing process, so we shoot droplets and by controlling the flow of the droplets in our curing, we can let all the droplets flow into each other and create smooth surfaces straight from the printing. Because all the layers will then blend into each other, we have only 0.2% haze value, which is, of course, optical quality. Um, whereas any other technology, any other 3D printing technology, will even after polishing still have about a 30% haze. Then what we also have straight from the process is our smooth surfaces. So we don't have to polish anything and of course with highly faceted parts, this is one of the great benefits of our process as well. So we can achieve smooth surfaces with a surface roughness of approximately 10 nanometers. Uh, we have had measurements of uh, even down to 4.5 nanometers, but that is just for specific structures and the best surface measurement we've ever had. So we hope to improve it further in the future and that we can also get into the real imaging optical parts. Here you can see our um, uh, scanning device, which is a stereoscopic camera. We will scan one part out of every batch that we print and then we can make a surface scan so we uh, we first coat the surface with a titanium oxide so that the white so that the stereoscopic camera can detect the surface um, and after the scanning we have a point cloud of the surface and we can compare it to the CAD file that way we can indicate what the tolerances are and of course we also use that in R&D to optimize our process further and further. 
this slide will show you a little bit about our capabilities. On the right side, the image shows you what our build, maximum building size is. So in X, Y dimensions, we can do 380 millimeters by 180 millimeters, so that's the size of our build plate. Um, it's also mentioned in inches, inches for the US people among us. Um, and then our maximum build height is 20 millimeters. Um, we can go slightly higher and we can even go a lot higher if needed because the, the 20 millimeters limitation is not a limitation of our printer. It's more a limitation of tolerances because, because we are an additive manufacturing process we do not only stack the material, we also stack errors if we have that in our process. So if you have something slightly larger than 20 millimeters, we can also evaluate that shape and we can tell you whether it's possible or not. Then you can also see that we have a minimum feature size, which is uh, approximately one millimeter uh, with a one by one millimeter shape we can pretty much guarantee the shape is the same as the CAD file. We can print smaller features, but they will have a deviation to the CAD file, which is predictable, but we cannot really compensate for it because it is an effect of our process and, uh, and it's hard to compensate for that. The minimum feature height is about 300 micron. And um, this is also the minimum step height, if you have it in your uh, optical part. Then if you, if you look at the tolerances in shape, our uh, shape conformity or average deviation uh, is approximately 100 micron. Uh, I think we're already down to 80 micron now, and we hope to improve that time after time. The file formats that we can receive is we, we can almost re uh, use every CAD file but it needs to be a solid so it can't be just a surface because of course we also need to uh, print the volume it itself as well. Um, but we prefer step or IGES files because they nicely uh, describe a curve instead of where the file makes triangles out of everything and um, if you don't save it with high enough resolution we end up printing your triangles. Here you can see that uh, a little bit more about our process. At the moment we do not yet have a temporary support material so it's not possible for us to print any shape. But what we can do is we can first print one shape which is mentioned here as A of course, that way we can print whatever intricate designs you come up with with a flat surface. So that's a single-sided print for us. To move into a double-sided print, we will print first a negative to the positive. We place the positive in it and then we can print onto the flat surface again, as you see in the fourth picture. That way we can create some shapes that wouldn't be possible with a single-sided product. In the next slide I have an example of that. We printed a, a TIR uh, shape lens which is a, a collimator and it, uh, it collimates the light into a, a narrow beam. Um, here you can see that this shape has a hollow where the LED goes into and then the collimator shape, the, um, the angles at the side, and they will work as internal reflection surfaces because um, the light will hit at an angle that is below the critical angle so you get total internal reflection. And then we can print onto the flat surface again another structure, in this case a micro uh, pillow structure which then again um, blends the light slightly better so even for RGB lighting you would get a nice homogeneous light and um, it also gives you the possibility to control the spread of the beam 
with this uh, pillow structure. And so you can create different beam angles with different pillow structures. What is important to see in this slide uh, and in this shape is that when we print a double-sided part, uh, the plane that we, uh, that we need to print from, so the flat plane that we built from, needs to be at the widest part of the optic, so where the red line is. Um, if we don't have that, then of course we will create overhangs which we cannot print without a temporary support material. Here you can see some of our material specifications. Um, of course, for an optical part, the transmission is uh, extremely important. We've compared it to PMMA um, because we also print with an acrylic and uh, PMMA is uh, one of the best optical materials around if you look at transmission data. You can see that we, uh, we miss some of the transmission that PMMA has in the lower wavelength region, so uh, especially below 400, 420 nanometers, and there's a, a larger gap between the PMMA and, uh, and uh, Lux OptiClear material that we have. Fortunately for us, that's with LED lighting, that's not really a big problem. Um, because LEDs start to transmit around 420 nanometers and have the first peak around 450. And as you can see in the graph, there we don't have that big a difference anymore uh, between our material and uh, PMMA material. Um, what does happen is that we have a slight initial yellowness in our material, uh, which is caused, of, of course, by the absorption of the violet and, uh, uh, and some of the blue light. Um, then you can see the refractive index of our material. Um, this is the, the curve that you can use. You can, uh, we have it in, uh, in Excel format, so you can upload it to uh, to whatever software you have, but of course in ZMAX it's integrated. You can choose our material from the material library. Um, yes, the next slide again. Um, so here we have um, a slide which uh, is a, a benchmark that we did where we compare uh, our material to um, some of the other uh, 3D printing methods that claim to have a, a clear material. Uh, Polyjet material from Opjet, um, they use I think the Vero Clear material um, where you can see that there's still quite some yellowness in it, um, but also that it's uh, uh, definitely not smooth. You can see the, the rings in the, in the, in the, in the part which you can also see in the multi-jet modeling. Uh, both surfaces definitely need polishing, and even after polishing, they're not really transparent. The stereolithography, so SLA, um, is the one that comes a little bit closer. We had to polish this part to, uh, to compare it with what we do, and because even SLA doesn't have a smooth surface finish, but we wanted to show in this picture also that there's still a big difference even after polishing an SLA part or our part because an SLA part will still have that 30% haze that I talked about earlier because of their layer-wise buildup and because we let all the layers blend into each other. So no post-processing and the low haze values is, is where we excel beyond all the other um, additive manufacturing of uh, clear materials. Um, I have uh, a few showcases here. First one, where we uh, did not really use the transparent properties of our material, but more the smooth surface finish and the ability to create really complex shapes. So here for the company Bartenbach we printed um, a highly faceted optical reflector. Um, on the bottom right you can see um, 
the end product that they uh, that they made when they that went into large series, um, which is the the molded part. Um, of course, we had to extend the shape towards the plane that we, but otherwise we can easily print that highly complex shape. This one created a, a wall washer, um, but we also printed an asymmetrical downlighter. Uh, we printed some reflector parts which were used for tunnel lighting, and we've printed several uh, uh, reflective parts for them, which of course we printed in the clear material, and then we had it coated by our coating partner in aluminum. Here you can see the transparent printed part and the coated part where you can see that all the facets are properly printed and are very nicely uh, equal in every shape. Um, we've also had some uh, imperial data from the measurements that they have done. I will show that on another showcase a few slides further. So here you can see they created an asymmetrical downlight with sharp cutoffs so you don't have the light spilled outside the window or uh, anywhere else that you uh, that you don't need the light. So it's a, it's a very efficient product, both for wall washing or for asymmetrical downlighting. What happened uh, with this product and what happens with a normal wall washer? Um, you can see a person coming around the corner and in the left picture where you have very sharp cutoffs left and right and top and bottom, you don't see any light on the person. Um, and you can also see a very nice and even illumination along the wall. Whereas in the right picture you do see light that is blinding the person walking towards the light and you can see that the light spread uh, or most of the light is aimed at the top of the wall and not throughout the wall. Which was from a product that was recently launched in um, April at Light and Building in, uh, in Frankfurt. Um, this is a customer that, uh, that also needed a reflect highly uh, faceted reflector part and uh, we of course, print, printed again the transparent part and then later had it coded and made a demonstrator or a test setup that you can see on the bottom left. And with this test setup, they made a scan and a comparison between uh, what they calculated in their software program, in their ray tracing software, and what came out of the measurement data. And it's hard to see maybe if, you, if you're looking at a small screen, but you can see a red line and a blue line that are approximately overlapping, which means that we were extremely accurate in matching the, the light output that they calculated. In the end, they transferred this downlighter product in, in several products with a 7, 3, and 1 uh, reflector part and uh, then made a whole series of, uh, uh, of these downlighters. Here we did something for um, Penn State University. This is also uh, a project that was published in Nature magazine. So this was my first co-publication. <laughs> it was uh, very nice for them because they wanted to, um, uh, to test out several designs where they needed asymmetrical uh, lens arrays with asymmetrical, uh, con well, it's not really convex shape, but asymmetrical uh, shapes. And what they wanted to do is to, uh, to increase the amount of light that would hit the uh, photosensitive cell throughout the day. Uh, what you, of course, in, uh, in a rooftop application, which was uh, their research field, in a rooftop application, solar cells are just aimed at one direction. And of course, is the, if the sun is perpendicular to, uh, to the solar cell, that's the, the time where most of the light will hit. But especially early in the day and later in the afternoon, there's not a lot of light hitting the photocell. 
So what they did with their optical parts is they reduced the amount of light that would hit at the high peak of the day, um, but they also increased the amount of light that would hit on the lower parts of the day, increasing the total amount of light that would hit the photosensitive cell uh, throughout the day. Um, so this was a very successful project for them and uh, actually they are uh, continuing uh, their research and we're, uh, we're doing a continue uh, pro project again uh, this year. Then uh, I would like to, uh, to transfer the word again to, uh, to Akash and uh, look forward to your questions at the end of the presentation. Thanks a lot. Okay, so okay, Brian so talked, about talked about the capabilities of Lux Excel and the unique aspects of their print optical printing process. What I want to talk to you a little bit about is Optic Studio's capabilities that enable you to design and convey optical systems for additive manufacturing. First of all, some of you that are attending may not be familiar with Optic Studio, and so to begin with, I just wanted to give you a broad overview. Optic Studio is software for optical and illumination system design. So it allows you to model a wide range of optical components, lenses, mirrors, diffractive components, um, prisms, all sorts of different types of optical components and illumination components. You can simulate how a system will behave and you can also optimize the system to make it perform better and achieve some sort of specification and then tolerance it as well to determine what effect assembly and manufacturing errors have on the performance of the system. Now specifically in regards to 3D printing, there are several things that we have added, many of them recently, to support 3D printing. First and foremost, we have Lux Excel's material that they use for 3D printing that Brahm talked about some moments ago, and that's now in the Optic Studio material catalog, and I can show that to you here. So inside of Optic Studio, if I go to the Libraries ribbon and then the Materials catalog, you'll now be able to scroll down the catalog list and you'll find a Lux Excel catalog that contains the material that Brahm was speaking about, Lux OptiClear. And what I can do is look at the properties of that material. First off, let me add that catalog to my system here. Okay, and then if I, actually let me, let me select a new file here, and if I then look at the internal transmission and the dispersion diagram for that material, you should see very good agreement with what Brahm was showing for their data. So you can see that the index of refraction is very similar to many common plastics, PMMA, polycarbonate, acrylic, and the internal transmission as well is as Brahm showed, very similar to PMMA. So you should see the exact same performance inside the software when you're simulating components made with Lux OptiClear as you would if you've got prototypes from Lux Excel that they've actually fabricated. And assigning this material to any component is as easy as coming here into the Lens Data Editor and typing in the name of that material. And now I can design a way. Okay, some other things to keep in mind that Optic Studio offers for aiding in, in these designs. As Brahm was talking about, their process does have some limitations on the size of the components, 
that, it, that they can create and thicknesses, diameters, those types of things. And what Optic Studio allows you to do is easily incorporate constraints into your optical design. So during the optimization process, you can define constraints in the merit function editor that will ensure you don't have a design that goes outside of those boundaries with which they are able to fabricate the component. Inside of Optic Studio, where you'll see that is in the Optimize ribbon. If you open the Optimization Wizard that helps you build a merit function, you see the boundary values here, and you can easily add glass boundary values, the ones that I had added uh, in the PowerPoint slide, based upon LuxExcel's uh, capabilities for minimum and maximum feature size. You can easily add those there, create targets for optical performance, and now that's, those constraints are automatically incorporated into your optical design. The same goes for tolerancing as well, that you can easily incorporate tolerance ranges uh, that are based upon what LuxExcel is capable of producing, you can incorporate those into your design and easily see what impact that has on the performance of your optical system. All right, some additional tools that aren't necessarily unique to 3D printed optics, but will certainly help in that case as well, Recently, we added a couple of tools that prepare a design for manufacture. So we, we added the design lockdown tool that does things like fix the precision of thicknesses to whatever is uh, reasonable for the manufacturing process that you are going to be using. There's also the convert to non-sequential tool to take your imaging or a focal system in sequential mode convert it to a 3D based model in non-sequential mode and allow you to do optomechanical and stray light analysis on that system. And lastly, the critical ray set generator and ray tracer, which performs a similar purpose where you can validate your system in non-sequential mode and make sure that whatever optomechanical changes you make are not adversely affecting the performance of the system. Okay, and, and the last thing I'd like to talk about here that is uh, important for 3D printing is the ability to export your design in a format that is usable by LuxExcel or whatever other vendor you're using. So Optic Studio does support the ability to export in four different static CAD formats, STEP, SAT, IGES, and STL. As Brahm mentioned previously, the preferred formats for LuxExcel are STEP and IGES, and that's as simple as selecting the file type when you're exporting your component. If I go into the software here, in either sequential or non-sequential mode, if you go to the file ribbon, you have the ability to export a CAD file. And there are various settings here to do with rays, if you want rays in your system, other tolerance settings as well. And then the most important one is here in the file type selection, where you can select again, I just or step are the preferred formats for Lux Excel. We also offer SAT and STL, and you can see the other options here in addition. Another thing that Optic Studio supports is that dynamic link to SolidWorks, Autodesk Inventor, and Creo. So if you need to do to add some additional complex features, maybe chamfers, maybe some other very intricate features that are difficult to model in Optic Studio, what you can do is 
get SolidWorks or Inventor or Creo to assist you in that process. And then, of course, those programs also support export to these formats as well. Okay, so that's primarily what we wanted to show you today. Uh, we, we appreciate you attending this webinar. And what LuxXL is doing is, is certainly very exciting in terms of revolutionizing optics manufacturing. Uh, we've also showed you some of the capabilities that Optics Studio supports to assist in the design of optical systems for 3D printing. And if you have any questions or comments, we're going to be starting the question and answer session shortly. If you're watching this recorded video, you can send questions or comments to ZMAX, support at ZMAX.com or to LuxXL using the service at LuxXL.com email address. So once again, thank you for attending, and we will start the question and answer session shortly. Okay, so Brahm and myself will be answering any questions that you all might have um, based upon what we talked about here. If you haven't attended one of our webinars, you can ask questions via the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. And again, if we don't have time to get to the questions that you asked, feel free to email one of those two email addresses that we provided previously, and we'll be happy to get back to you. So with that, uh, I'll go ahead and take a look at some of the questions that we have here. Okay, and I'll go through the list and, and any that pertain to Optics Studio, I'll be happy to answer those. And questions that pertain to LuxXL and their 3D printing process, I will present those to Brahm. So, Let's see here, the first question, Brahm, that I'll present to you, um, how, how do measurements of the surface rough, how were measurements of the surface roughness on transparent material done, and what instrument was used for this measurement? Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, well, we, uh, we have used... Uh, uh, some uh, we've used the University of Eastern Finland to do these measurements for us. We have on our website uh, um, some uh, some data for it. And if you if you email me uh, on the on the service, uh, I can also uh, send you a, a full data sheet on how the measurement was done because I think it's a little bit hard to uh, to explain just verbally. Okay, so uh, thanks, Brahm, for that, and uh, maybe you'll follow up there. I'll uh, move on to the next question. All right, um, the next question is: How can you design TIR lenses with Optics Studio? There, there are a few ways that you can do that 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 we have done previously, and we've also seen um, some other customers do previously. One way to do that is in non-sequential mode, you can combine multiple objects using uh, either the nesting rule or using Boolean objects. And you have the ability to design components where, say, some portion of the, uh, the, the emitted source light uh, is refracted through some central portion of uh, a lens and maybe the peripheral portion of the light undergoes TIR. So that is one possible way to do it, where you can combine, you know, any range of objects, CPCs, um, rotated, faceted objects, uh, any of a number that we support. Another way to do it would be using the part designer capability. So uh, part designer is kind of a um, uh, a mini CAD program within Optics Studio 
that allows you to design more complex parts than you otherwise would uh, with native objects. And Part Designer allows you to do things like form a, uh, um, a spline and rotate that about the optical axis, combine that with other shapes as well. So I think either through the nesting rule in non-sequential mode or using Part Designer in Optics Studio, you would be able to design TIR lenses. And I believe that we have an example on our website in the, in the design application section of, of just such a component, as well in the samples folder that comes with Optics Studio, you should find a design applications folder there that, that illustrates one of these methods for designing a TIR lens. Okay, so another question here for Brahm on the uh, additive manufacturing side. What sort of pricing for small quantity samples? Um, Brahm, I'll let you answer that. Maybe you might need some more information there, but I'll let you take a crack at that one. Yeah, um, of course our our prices are based on uh, on the CAD file, but I can uh, I can give you a, a rough uh, price indication. Our prices are based mainly on the volume of material that we need to print and slightly on on the shape um, because uh, for uh, for different shapes we might need to use different settings that take longer print times um, but um, for um, the prototype price we have approximately the prices between well let's say 75 percent of our optical prototypes will be between 750 and 2000 euros um, additional prototype parts, so if you want um, three or five or ten of exactly the same parts, then the additional parts are just 10% of that. So, for example, if your first part is 1,000 euros then, and you need three parts, then the three parts will be 1,200. So, twice 10% added. Um, if you go to larger numbers than just 10 parts, we can offer you even more competitive prices. If you go into your iteration processes, um, so if you want to change your design slightly, we can offer iterations at 25% of your initial prototype price. So if, the again, the first prototype would be 1,000, then we can uh, offer the iteration, so the slight design change at 250 euros. And then the additional parts will again be 10% of the initial prototype, so again 100 per part. I hope this, uh, this answered it. Uh, yeah, this is the best I can answer without a CAD file. <laughs> okay, thanks for that, Brom. Another one for you here, I'm just going down the list. We, we've got a lot of questions and uh, we'll take about another 15 minutes and answer them in the order in which they came in. Um, what about the maximum draft angle for Fresnel lenses? Is there a limitation there? Uh, yes, there are two limitations important, of course, for Fresnel lenses. That's the top and bottom radii and, of course, the draft angles. Um, the top and bottom radii, um, the top radii we can achieve, our best top radii we can achieve is about 100 micron. The best bottom radii we can achieve is approximately 80 micron. If you have slightly larger Fresnel rings, we would probably opt for a setting that creates even smoother surfaces than um, and uh, then with our uh, sharpest uh, setting. Um, so then the radii would probably get a little bit bigger, but it will always be better than what milling can do with uh, the 250 uh, micron bottom radii. 
and then for the draft angles we can go up to uh, to 88 degrees with our best setting for vertical walls um, but other settings need a slightly larger draft angle so if you want to be safe then uh, we could go to 80 degrees but I think for uh, for Fresnel lens we would probably opt for a setting that would um, be good for, uh, for better for vertical walls um, because of course the, if, if you get the, the larger draft angles of course the, the Fresnel lens is less effective. Okay, thanks Brom. Next question is one for me. How do you link Optics Studio to SolidWorks for editing a part? Several versions ago, actually this was probably back with ZMAX 12, about four years ago, we added a SolidWorks link to the premium edition of the software and essentially what that allows you to do is open SLD PRT files directly in Optic Studio. And the advantage there over using static CAD formats, StepSat, I just STL, is that if you have smart dimensions assigned on the SolidWorks part, you can expose those smart dimensions in the editor inside of Optic Studio and then you have the ability to modify those parameters, optimize them, tolerance them directly within Optics Studio. Once you have modified those parameters, you then have the ability to save the component back to SLDPRT format um, and avoid having to deal with uh, static CAD parts altogether. Okay, uh, Brom, some, looks like uh, more questions for you. I think people are very excited about the capability that you all have. So the next question is, uh, have you looked at whether outgassing of these 3D printed optics is an issue? Um, yes, we have looked at that. Um, we didn't do full measurements on it, but um, if you look at uh, how our partner does the coating, they use it. Uh, they do coating in um, uh, at room temperature in a vacuum chamber, and that they don't have any problems with uh, with gases coming out of our products uh, affecting their process. Tells us that we don't have a lot of outgassing. Of course, there will always be some slight outgassing still um, for parts of the optic that might not be fully cured. Um, but um, we do some post-curing on our materials and uh, um, we do not see a lot of problems with outgassing. I wouldn't use them uh, inside a human body uh, <laughs> because uh, our material is not medical graded. I hope this uh, this answers the question sufficiently. Okay. Uh, next question: Has LuxXL successfully been used in an imaging application? Um, we've been successful in imaging applications if it was near field, so uh, very close to where it needed to be, so for virtual reality glasses or something like that, there our lenses have been successfully applied. For um, other imaging applications uh, with larger distances, uh, we've only been used for, uh, um, uh, for inspirational prototyping. Uh, because we are not at that point of imaging quality yet, although we are nearing it. I okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Another question for you, Brom. Are additional LuxXL materials with different properties in development? Um, currently not. Um, uh, we do hope to uh, to develop further materials uh, with our process, 
like a temporary support material or a material with a different refractive index or perhaps even reflective materials or uh, um, where um, with a material where you can blend in nanoparticles or stuff like that. At the moment we only have our uh, Lux OptiClear material. Okay. Uh, another question for you here. So we have uh, probably about seven minutes left. We'll try to get to as many more questions as we can. Do you think that in the future it will be possible to scale 3D printing to larger optical devices and how big? Um, theoretically, yes. Um, because uh, what we now have our print bed, um, the size of the print bed is limited by the by the machine and by the amount of print heads that we have in the printer now. So our production production printer, the largest uh, one we have, uh, that can do 180 by 380 millimeters uh, in x and y dimensions. It can go, uh, of course, if you increase the number of print heads, you can also increase the, the build plate size. Um, so, um, theoretically, it's, uh, it can be as large as your building. But, of course, there's always price consideration. Okay, great, thank you. Another question. Uh, which laser in what laser intensity range can you use with this material? Um, this is very hard to to answer um, because different wavelengths, uh, of course, produce a different uh, have different absorption uh, in our material, um, and therefore also the the heat. Um, absorption uh, in our material is different. Um, I think the heat is the largest problem that we have with, uh, with laser um, because uh, it is of course highly uh, intense, very focused light and uh, our material can with operating temperature can go up to about 60 degrees and for prototyping you can test up to about 70 degrees but above that um, our material will discolor uh, more rapidly. Okay. Next question. Can you explain what haze is and how it affects the performance of the lens? Um, yes. Um, haze is, um, well, uh, as, um, if, if you drive through fog, you can, uh, you can see something blurry. And I think that's exactly what haze is. Um, so haze is some, um, mostly some some air bubbles or some other pollution inside an optical part that causes uncontrolled scattering, and it will blur your vision. So it will also blur the light, and it will scatter the light to places where you don't want it. Okay. All right. Thanks, Brom. We'll probably have time for just a couple of more questions here. What is the long-term stability of the material? Does it change shape over time? Um, for what we've seen, it doesn't change shape over time. Um, what we do see is that we see a loss of transmission over time. We see about, we haven't measured it with our latest material, but our um, uh, material before that we saw uh, uh, about 0.8% transmission loss over 1,000 hours. Um, so, um, Shape-wise, we don't we don't see any problems. Um, Transmission-wise, over longer periods of time, um, you would see some transmission loss, and uh, also because the transmission loss will be mainly in the blue light region, uh, you would also see some uh, some yellowness increasing. Okay. Um question for me here, how could haze be simulated in Optics Studio? 
So by default, materials in Optics Studio are homogeneous and of course have the nominal properties that are defined in the material catalog. Hay is probably the, the most accurate way to simulate it because it's, it's a volumetric effect would be in non-sequential mode, you can apply bulk scattering properties to any volume that you define. Um, sorry, was that a question? Was there a question for me now? Oops, sorry, I think that my uh, my headset died there briefly, but I'm back on now. Um, so, so again, as I was saying, bulk scattering is probably the best way to simulate haze in in Optics Studio, uh, and there are various bulk scatter models that you could use. Me scattering, Rayleigh scattering, just depending on. Uh, what the exact properties are that you're trying to simulate. Um, okay, so we probably have time maybe for just one more uh, question here. Let me take a look at the remaining ones and see if there's one very different from anything that's been uh, asked here. Um, let's see. Okay, here's a good one uh, for Brahm. Is it possible to print a tapered light pipe with your process? How are the surface qualities? Um, for example, how is a sharp corner of the light pipe simulated or, or printed? Um, well, if you have sharp corners, then of course we will have uh, a radius there because we print, of course, with a fluid that we cure. Um, it will depend on uh, on the shape largely because um, uh, it will also depend on how we can orient it. Um, so if it's uh, going to be a top radius, then uh, um, then we will have a radius of about uh, 100 micron, um, and um, of course it it needs the the light pipe needs to hold. Uh, a flat plane somewhere inside the optical part. Uh, we can print it with, uh, if, if you look at the, um, if we, we print a double sided part, if you would look at the optical part, then uh, the, 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 um, the plane between the two sides, it should not be in one of your optic. Uh, in, in one of your optical functional surfaces. So it, if you look at it perpendicular or at an angle, you don't see any optical boundary. But at the side, you do, some, you do see um, a small line if you look at it perpendicular to the plane. Uh, sorry, if you look parallel to the plane. So it, it will depend on what kind of light pipe we would have to print. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Brom. It looks like we are out of time now. So for those of you that uh, had questions that didn't get answered, again, feel free to email either us here at ZMAX or Brom and his colleagues over at Lux Excel, depending on whether the question pertains to their uh, printing process or to the simulation capabilities in Optics Studio. We really appreciate all of you taking the time to join us here today and we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Um, one other thing for those of you who have colleagues who are unable to attend, the recorded video will be posted to our website within a few days. Um, so again, thank you very much for attending this webinar, and we look forward to uh, you joining us again in the future. Goodbye.